a friend of mine always said there is this need for speed progress bar and uh, a need for speed how the progress bar worked it was just filling up in a while and it was like going faster and faster but at some point it's just stopped at the very end and it's a little bit like this i feel like maybe we are very close to it but we actually don't know what the real progress is it's just a progress bar moving and as long as we move everybody is happy On this episode, we're talking with Richard Meissner, who is a co-founder of SAFE. Kevin, what did you think about this episode? This is already one of my favorite episodes. I would describe it as the definitive account abstraction episode. If you're curious about learning more of the mystical, magical term that you hear around crypto Twitter, this is the episode for you. He goes into a bunch of the EIPs that make up account abstraction. And he presents Safe Core Protocol, which is a white paper that they just put out. And he does a really good job of like acknowledging just the complexity of the problem. And he is not claiming to have solved that problem. If anything, I think he was super modest in the way he articulated. They are introducing a way to think about the problem and a way for developers and other wallet engineers to even begin to approach tackling this this problem. So I thought it was really great. Was there anything that stuck out to you? Yeah, I think the modularity piece is really interesting in in the the sort of entire system that they've designed feels like they have a lot of different places for individual accounts to plug in, but also for modules to sort of take on new interesting logic around accounts. So I think there's a ton of little nuggets of information here and also probably a lot of rabbit holes to go down. So this is a really fun episode. All right, let's jump into it. We are here with Richard Meissner, who is a co-founder of SAFE and just published an account abstraction paper that we're super excited to dive into. Richard, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Happy to be here. Happy to share some information there. I mean, it's, to be fair, just our introduction uh, paper, basically. It's actually quite high level, not, not too many details revealed yet, but... Yeah, it was also something to create clarity for ourselves, what's going on actually, and where do we want to go. GM, Richard, thanks for coming. GM. Yeah, super excited to get into some of the, the high-level thinking that you've been doing around account abstraction. But before we do that, maybe you can give a little bit of context on how you got into crypto and how you got to where you are right now at SAFE. Sure, happy to do this. So... I started in crypto in 2017, and actually before this, I was working on a uh, another startup that was working on a teeny mobile video app. So basically TikTok before TikTok. It was fun, but completely different to where we are right now, way more closed source. And basically they moved from Berlin to New York, and I didn't want to move to New York since I have family here. And so actually Stefan, uh, who I am whom I knew from university, basically picked me up and he was like, hey, look, at Gnosis, we want to go mobile. We want to do self-custody and uh, for users because that's what we require for prediction markets. We need that users have massive amounts of funds and they are owning them and that they are secure. And that's basically how it in 2017 got me into the team. And that's also where I really started my journey into the uh, deep details of the Ethereum ecosystem, which was fun. It was very fun for me, especially the early days where a lot of figuring out the ecosystem, which was very different because it was very open. And if you go into more of this TikTok where everything like or traditional mobile development, it's way more closed when in Ethereum, you basically everybody shares their source code. You can meet everybody and everybody's happy to share. And so this is where then basically I started as a mobile dev, but I very quickly started diving into the smart contract level, started writing the together, like based on some very initial drafting from Stefan and started designing the safe contract, the first version. And yeah, based on this, since that was the core, I started taking on more and more technical ownership inside the safe project on the Gnosis wallet part of the project, which then became the safe part. And yeah, that's um, at some point, Tobias also joined, who was also a friend from university, who is one of the other co-founders. And Lucas joined, who is also another co-founder. And in a different department of Gnosis, there was Christoph and all of us coming together then and spinning out, starting this two years ago nearly. We started planning the spin out and that's how us four got together and spinning out uh, safe into a separate project. 
Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious from that perspective. SAFE has changed quite a lot over the last few years and, and with the spin out and all of that. Can you give a little bit of an overview of how things have evolved sort of from the start to now sort of pioneering some of the account abstraction standards and, and really starting to lead the way in terms of how we implement some of these things? Sure. Actually, we started in when we started in 2017 2018 right like the vision was really to bring self custody via smart contract accounts to the individual user which is actually quite interesting because in between at some point we then got away from this because there was no market yet in 2018 for individual user based smart contract accounts and we went towards the case where we said oh let's support teams so we wanted to have like the people that had the traditional gnosis multi-sig which actually quite some teams had that they jump over and so that's where we really focused our ui on and we're also doing a lot of improvements there when it comes to security and the versions how you can make it in, um, interoperable to a lot of the existing protocols with off-chain signing and so on but there it was still around this user interface and then when we were spinning out the question for us was okay what where do we really want to go with safe and there we said okay why it's nice that we have an interface but actually the power of smart contracts is that they are super flexible they are like like the safe was a modular smart contract account from the beginning you can cover basically every use case that you can imagine in web3 with such a smart account but we cannot handle this all of ourselves. So that's really where we went, okay, we want to build an ecosystem, right? Like we want to create a, a piece of technology that everybody can build on top of. And we want to have the tooling and the like also to some extent a governed ecosystem that supports all of the stuff that's building on top of this is where we said, okay, we're gonna spin out, gonna launch the safe token to also utilize, uh, like to build this ecosystem, to foster this ecosystem. And that's where we are now. And I think then some thoughts are coming back, right? Like this more individual use case, especially with 4337, got more traction again. So it's quite interesting because quite often we have discussions again that we had three to four years ago. They're coming up again and people think it's something new. And we are like, oh yeah, we have actually, we can find some data that we talked about a couple of years ago, but it becomes more relevant now. There's a little bit more visibility now, which is very nice to see. Yeah. You mentioned 4337 and, and some of these conversations starting to come up. Maybe where we can start our conversation around account abstraction and how you're approaching and thinking about some of these things would be just like at a high level, an overview of some of the standards that have been put forth and the EIPs that exist out there. Maybe starting with 4337, but also, you know, might be worth covering 1271 and 6900 and all of those. So yeah, maybe we can sort of start with a broad strokes overview of what exists in the account abstraction landscape today, particularly as it relates to EIPs. Sure. Yeah, happy to start with 4337 because it's, it's I think, the most known one currently because it became like the synonym for account abstraction, which is... I think that's a controversial view, at least from our side. Not sure if we want to see it like this, but it definitely created a lot of visibility and it definitely created a lot of right thoughts into the right direction, at least, right? Like, if not more. And because in general, in account abstraction, it's like to very simplify that what you want to achieve is that currently things like how is replay protection done? So that's the nonce. How do you verify signatures? And how do you pay for gas fees? That's all very central to the protocol and you have no choice then to follow. You have to use the ECDSA signature with a monotonously increasing nonce and you have to pay the fee token in ETH, uh, like all the fees in ETH from such an EOA. And with account abstraction, we want to move away from this and let it get to an account. And there is a lot of controversy how to get there because there's a lot of things to cover there when it comes to denial of service attacks. And this is really where 437 made a very big first throw and they said, let's define an interface. We want to have like, this is their user operation basically and their entry point. And we're gonna do some research based with that. Okay, what are certain things that we have to protect against with denial of service attacks? What restrictions do we have to make which with the bundlers? And actually we have a standardized interface for accounts to abstract away, like it's up to the accounts how they want to track the nonce, it's up to account which signature format they want to use, and then they can also pay the gas fee. So already this first step that they create an interface that you can align around and that you can also get some insights actually, what are the limits, right? Like what are blockers are a very important step. From the safe side, it's definitely something which for us, it's a little bit 
tricky there how to best approach this, to be honest, in the sense of we have quite a lot of users, which quite a lot of funds. I think we had SafeCon last weekend, right? Like, and there we had this big, nice intro screen where it says, like, we have 50 plus billion dollars of funds locked in safe contracts. So pushing for a new standard that is potentially still in draft and experimental state and is evolving is always like a little bit, okay, how, how fast do we do this? How, when can we expose it to our users? So it's a little bit like yeah. that we still have to juggle, but it's definitely a standard that we are closely following, interacting also with the devs from Force 37, so Yoav and also Tor, which definitely is interesting and we're deeper looking into this. To go to other standards, right? Like that we have been actually looking uh, quite a lot longer with is 1271. So 1271 is to have contract signatures, right? Like, so what we know from ECDSA and a lot of the devs, they nowadays actually are moving away from everything happens on chain, but you have more signatures and then they do signature verification and then just settle certain things on chain. I think one of the well-known protocols that started this quite early where OpenSea was doing some stuff with this or also a former Gnosis project uh, Cow protocol was doing a lot of stuff with this and now this goes more and more into also one inch doing a lot of stuff and Uniswap with this but contracts in general were, were not compatible with this so 1271 came along and says okay there's a standardized interface and you can verify the signature however the contract says against the contract and here one of the big challenges is that actually a lot of the depths have not really fully support this in the sense of that they still think, hey, we first, like we try to handle everything like an ECDSA signature, like from a private key account and actually not first try to handle it like a smart contract signature or check if there's a contract at the expected address. And so this is, even so it's like, as we can see from the number, the oldest standard that relates to smart contract accounts, even there we still see the adoption is not there yet where it should be. And also here, jumping back a little bit, 437, 437 created a lot of visibility to get more adaption for the standard, where it's like, no matter what you think or not think about uh, 437, alone for this, 437 was very valuable to create more visibility on this. Yeah, so, and the last one also that you mentioned before, it like was 6900, which is the newest one, and it's building on top of 437, at least to some extent, and there it's a little bit around more with, when we... Like smart contract accounts in itself are nice, but the real power, and that's also what SAFE was trying to achieve from the beginning, is that they are very flexible and that they can be modular, right? Like, so you can extend them depending on the use case. You can, similar how we are used to it in Web2, that you can use plugins on your Google account. Facebook has this for ages that you can add apps or stuff like this, right? Like the comparison, I think most people will easily get is uh, actually Lucas, another co-founder, mentions this quite often. Say, you can imagine it as a smartphone, right? Like a smart contract account is a smartphone without apps. And if you make it a modular smart contract account, that means you can start installing apps. And that's what made smartphones super powerful. And 6900 tries to standardize this a little bit more that we can say, okay, how can we build these modules, these plugins, so that they can be used by as many accounts as possible, so that we minimize login effects, that we can have a larger pool of apps that can be used everywhere. But it's quite tricky because I mean, it's the same as we see in Web2 with all the mobile phones. There is no one standard for all the apps. Yeah, it's very hard to get all the account developers to say, yes, we all agree on the plugin standard and we then going to follow it to the detail in our accounts. But yeah, also there are a lot of interaction, actually very good vibes inside the wider smart contract ecosystem. We got together in Paris. We're talking a lot about stuff when also related to security when it comes to permissioning. How can you hand out permissions? How can you better handle security? And it's also for the safety. One of the biggest focus points is really the security part because that's what was stopping us for the last four years to really push fully on the module side is that we say each module, you have to give it the same security guarantees as you give to your core for smart contract account, which in the safe sense means they need to be audited, they need to run a bug bounty, and they, best case, would be formally verified. I'm not sure if you can give, get this from all the module developers. Right? Like, so, yeah, these are the three big topics happening and where we're also looking into. What I'm hearing is, at a high level, account abstraction is a very complicated problem. In the announcement blog post for uh, Safe Core Protocol, you described it as a wicked problem which is essentially a problem that gets more complicated as you try to solve it. And 
most people that are paying kind of loose attention to account abstraction that will associate 4337 like with account abstraction as a whole. But in reality, that is only a very small piece of the problem. And we have these other standards like 1271, 6900 that are attempting to focus on different aspects of this large, more complicated problem. And so I think that kind of gets us to safe core protocol. And what it sounds like is an attempt at bundling this like large set of small problems into a standard for a way to attack each side of this like complicated problem and maybe make sure that we do it in a way that retains the values of why we're here and tries to avoid things like vendor lock-in. So yeah, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the proposal that you introduced and your team for safe core protocol. And maybe even before that, Richard, like one of the things that you outlined in the protocol that Kevin, you hinted at there or in the paper is these like three kind of design challenges around fragmentation, vendor lock and insecurity risk. I'd be curious for you to give some context there and then we can go into the protocol itself and some of the components. Yeah, let's start. I think these three points are very important, right? Like, so um, I hinted at it when I talked a little bit about 6900, where I said, right, like, it's it's non-trivial to align on really a standard. And this is actually what we see now with 4337 happening is a little bit, okay, we got a large hype, but this large hype came with a lot of like everybody building their own new smart contract wallet, which is good. I'm not going to say this is necessarily bad, but it also leads, everybody does their thing a little bit different. And this obviously means that a lot of the tooling, and this is one of the also points that we see is like, there's no standardized tooling, right? Like we are used to, like in the EOA world, we are used to having ESA scan or block scout at least, where they give you a lot of context information about what is happening. If you ever tried looking at a user operation from 437 on chain, this is completely different. I mean, MetaMask is, uh, I'm not sure if it's live already, but they have want to, they're going to launch support for user operations. But even then, you still don't understand how is the wallet working. So one level further down because there's no standardization. So this, this is a little bit this fragmentation problem where you then see, okay, everybody's doing it slightly different. And again, it becomes then harder for the users and the tooling, like not even for the users directly, but the tooling that is then used by the users to be in a state that it really it provides the best UX and that we're going fully forward, right? And if we take this fragmentation to an extreme that it says like one player just pushes their model and since it's not compatible then this one player then everybody is locked into this one player right and everybody follows has to follow what they're doing and this is a, a dynamic where it's like not hey we find the best that works for the ecosystem rather we follow this one standard and we have seen dynamics like this before and even so i don't want to speak negatively about another team because i also know that for example but the example came from a little bit former times of metamask metamask does i think a lot to try to do a lot of ecosystem support. I, so I'm not, it's not meant that it's generally negative, but we've seen also parts where they say, okay, we, they had to do similar consideration as we did. They had a lot of users using all standards and therefore they don't move towards new ones. So there's, for example, a point where the East sign implementation behaves slightly different to how it's defined in the wallets in the sense of you normally should e-sign should not get your access to the raw uh, like signing logic but should prefix it with a message like the serum signed message which for a long time i think now they actually changed it which i'm very happy about but for a long time this was not the case and then it behaved a little bit differently if you take rainbow wallet for example or if you take metamask which was annoying and these examples you see that then it's also for the team like metamask had to actively work against it right like they had to put a lot of effort and also to to be then ecosystem friendly and this is obviously a danger that we also see with um, smart contract wallets right like why it could be positive for one team that gets most of the attention and then most of the traffic it has a risk that certain standards are not developing in a meaningful way is user experience is hindered because it's not portable and it's not composable right like so this is where this vendor login yeah needs to be looked at critically and uh, i think also in general we want to have an open ecosystem right like uh, as i mentioned when i said like one of the things that i love the serum is that it is open right like and would be very sad if we uh, lose this and then the last point, which is security, is for me personally one of the most important points in the sense of that 
I mentioned it before, right? Like, so this modular logic, it's very powerful. It's very flexible. You can basically solve every use case. But in a straightforward approach, you need to give quite a lot of power towards this plugin or this module. And then if you enable one malicious module, it's as good as handing away your private key of an EOA, right? Like, so this is kind of critical and we have to create a system where this works because even for crypto native people, this is already super hard to judge. If, uh, if we now take it to non crypto natives, to the people that we want to reach going forward, it becomes even harder. It's very important because if you do one misstep, then all the trust into the smart contract approach is lost again. And then we have to really start rebuilding a lot of trust. And we have seen this, right? Like when there was a parity case where parity, they used a library, which is similar to a proxy. And then this was self-destructed and suddenly all their wallets became useless, right? It created a lot of fear into this, hey, is proxies approach the right way? Because, you know, if your master copy or your singleton gets destroyed, everything becomes useless and smart contract wallets, how should we handle this? And it takes a lot of time to build this trust again. And then also you don't know, do people trust the system now again because they forgot about parity or because they know that it now works? And I'm not sure which one is better there, but because normally you should not forget, right? Like um, this is this is also there where the, the white paper comes in for us, right? Like where we really wanted to go into the details. How can we tackle some of these problems and why do we see that it's not enough to just basically have 4337 and 6900, but that we have to also try to put them into context and see how they interact with each other. And that's where we in the protocol came up with this registry and the manager. Yeah, I definitely want to dive into each of the individual components of the the protocol itself and sort of unpack each of them. At a very high level, though, it feels like it is a, a protocol for an abstraction above accounts themselves. And, and I think there's there's some interesting parallels as well between the, the existing sort of approach for safe with modules and then pulling in a very different kind of module, but not totally dissimilar module to this protocol system. So maybe we can start by giving just a high level overview of the system, and then we can dive into each of the components of it. Sure, happy to do this. Like, I'm going to start with the core component, which is the account, which is for us currently in this very initial version, also when we think about it, will be the safe account. But in general, it could be any account. You could use Empire, Zero Dev, Arch, and whatever. But for us right now, it's the safe account when we evaluate a lot of the approaches. And then you have these modules. And again, there you could use, uh, we are like originally had our safe modules, but we actually tried to come up with some new standards that make certain things more secure because we had a lot of learnings from our early days, safe modules where we had a heavy usage of delegate calls. There was no native batching and all of this. We learned a little bit more how developers use our modules and also what are security assumptions. So we did some restructuring there. Also in general, this could be something where 6900 plays a big role, right? Like currently it's just that it's way earlier right now that we cannot say which is the final standard. That's why this currently differs. But if you can see this for me mentally, the accounts, it's a lot of uh, around also the topic, how does 437 user operations define your account? So that's also where safe and the accounts works. And then we have plugins, which is 6900 and this logic. And in general, well, how it works is right, like you want to enable these plugins on your account. And when we think about this, as mentioned before, there is quite some security assumptions. And when we thought about this, is we don't want the users to constantly think about it. Right? Like in a perfect world, and I know it's not a perfect example, but if you think about your phone, you kind of trust Apple that they do some reviewing. I'm not saying that Apple is perfect and good, but it, it takes away a little bit of the paranoia from the user because they have some trust in them. And so we thought, okay, how would we want to create a system where we can have also something that we can trust a little bit more like Apple, but in like a good way. If we say that Apple is too, too centralized, right? Like we want to move it more towards the ecosystem. And that's where we then came, okay, if we have this logic, we need a security component there. And then we actually said, okay, oh, a simple way to start with this is that we have these registries. So these are the three components. And actually also on the registry, it's it's not that we are the only team thinking about it. There's, uh, there are a couple of other teams that we're also interacting with. There's Rhinestone, for example, but even inside 6900, a lot of these permission sorts are coming up. And then we have these three components and then they somehow have to interact. And this is where we currently say we have some, we call it the manager, but it 
it's just a component that basically says on certain interaction flows, so when you activate a plugin or when a plugin does a transaction, you do security checks, right? Like so, and with this on a security level, it allows us to enforce certain permissions, security patterns, and we can start validating that the involved parties have some level of security. And obviously this is not like the perfect way, right? Like in the sense of this, it depends very much on the security of this registry. And if you read the white paper, you will realize that the, that we actually do not go much into the details. Okay. How does a perfect registry look like? Right? Because we have to be honest. We don't know right now. And you can easily argue there is no one perfect registry. And there are very interesting articles to read on also from, especially from the rhinestone team where they said, okay, what is a perfect registry? Right? Like, oh, how they would approach this. But yeah, in this case, for us, what we really are going to look into is like, okay, how do we want to see a registry? What also is missing to provide the security of the registry? But these are the three components that interact through the manager with each other, right? Like, so that there are four core components currently in our protocol outlined. So if I could give like a high level summary and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, there are existing EIPs for a lot of the, the major pieces in account abstraction. We can put them into a few buckets. We have the accounts bucket, the modules bucket, and maybe it's not specific to account abstraction, but like we could then create a bucket for registries. And so we have these solutions that exist in each of these buckets. And so that is a broad enough problem space in itself. And if, you know, 10 different teams were to like, look at these three buckets, they might come up with 10 different ways for these buckets to interact. So it sounds like what safe core protocol is doing is introducing this glue, this manager that sits in between these different buckets. And it allows for the complexity to grow in each of their respective places, but it tries to sort of restrain the complexity at least enough so that we can create some standardization around what an account abstraction wallet might look like. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yes, that's a very fair assessment. We, I think the minimum that we want to have is that uh, there are clear interfaces defined for each of these buckets, how you set them so that we can interact them. And because that's then the clue, right? Like, and how they interact with each other. And that's exactly also what you mentioned, right? Like that we need to always consider that these things should work together as one account system in the end, right? Like a smart or modular smart account system. And why it's good that certain things first start individually, if we disregard the other parts that we need to integrate, then it will make it harder in the end to really bring it together. Okay. Yeah. So then let's maybe dig a little bit further into, I think, People may already be somewhat familiar with like the accounts bucket. It's what we talk about when we're talking about just smart contract accounts. I think the modules bucket has some things we could go through within that. Can you separate the difference between something like plugins, hooks, and then there's like function handlers, signature validators? It sounds like you're allowing for this room of like additional complexity to live within the modules bucket. But how do you categorize that complexity and, and how are you thinking about it? Yes. So where we differentiate, right, like plugins and hooks. So we have certain components, like, which we call plugins, which can execute to or through as a plugin can execute transaction, right? Like, so this is where we say these are potentially the most critical, but the most powerful ones, because they, whenever you whitelist them, they can basically trigger whatever transaction they want especially if there's no coherent permission model or no complex permission model, but therefore it can also do a lot of things like automate a lot of things and have a lot of possibilities. And here, why we want to separate them, right? Like, especially since the security risk or the responsibilities here are so high, we want to really clearly separate them that it's not one malicious, that you can basically create this permission layer in between and that you have some risk. And the hooks then are basically um, how we started using them are an enhancement to the security layer in the sense of you have additional ways to hook into this life cycle of these plugins and react to certain interactions, which either allows you to have additional security checks based on your configuration. But what we have also seen recently, actually, they allow you to react, right? Like if you think about Uniswap hooks, they are basically you react towards an action before or after to prepare or like follow up on certain things, right? Like so why we introduced them originally as an additional security feature, you can also use them to then chain certain actions on the cross chain. But there by default, a hook in itself does not have 
like it cannot execute actions over your account, but it could theoretically block any interaction, right? Like, which is a different form of critical because, I mean, locking up your funds, you could argue it's not as bad as getting all your funds stolen, but it's also not good. <laughs> that's, and then we have these function handlers and that's uh, where we see that actually for us, it came in that the ecosystem space is quite fast evolving and you want that certain methods can be handled by a smart account, right? Like, and that a certain plugins can react to certain methods. And we originally, we started introducing this because NFT, so ERC721, if you intake with smart contract accounts and you want to do the safe transfer, they have a safe transfer method, then they actually need to call into a smart contract and it needs to respond in a very specific way. And the safe originally didn't have this callback. So now we had the choice, okay, do we add it natively or do we find some other way? The challenge was then ERC-777 came around, slightly different callback interface. And then ERC-1155 came around, slightly different. Inter and so this was where we said, okay, we, we're going to have to find a way where we can extend these, we can react to these. And actually also when we think about smart contract signatures, so 1271, right, like you have actually quite a lot of dynamics and where you can be quite flexible. Speaking about 1271, actually, it's very interesting. And we said, okay, it's contract signatures are such a significant part that we actually give it a dedicated component. These are the signature validators or other projects just call them validators. We say creating or providing more flexibility there or more native flexibility there with a lot of cool use cases. And one of the examples is that we worked with the cow team on this TWAP handler so basically in a simplified way that it allows you is that actually for these off-chain order handling that they have you can set different conditions you can have a dedicated key that allows your off-chain order handling for a dedicated pair right like so you actually have different rules for your order handling on cow swaps than you have for your normal transaction flow and this is for off-chain signatures so they actually don't trigger a transaction and Again, this is a very powerful feature, and I think the security here might be underestimated, or the security aspect can be underestimated, because as more and more stuff moves off-chain, obviously this also becomes critical to some extent. A very fun example here is that, also related to CowSwap, and it was the... Uh, I think it was a yarn team. I would have to lie. If, uh, but yeah, they, what they basically did was they had their funds stuck because their their hook or their guard was not working properly anymore. And how they got their funds out of the safe was actually since they had set allowance towards cow swaps, they could use off-chain signatures via 1271, which are not protected by the hook. They actually wrote a blog post about this, which is, it's very interesting to see. And right now it's like, it gives you mixed feeling because on one side you say, oh, their security is missing. On the other side, you see, hey, look how powerful this off-chain signature logic is, right? Like, so this is why we clearly want to separate them because each of them have their corresponding security assumptions that you have. And this becomes also very interesting if you then think about the manager and potential future for the manager. In the sense of why, when we started thinking about this is also with the registries, what we theoretically want to have is that certain things can happen automatically. Like if we look at the Web2 world, if my bank, and that's maybe one of the positive aspects of being transparent towards your bank, if they see that my credit card is being used in Japan right now, even so my I just was in a restaurant in Berlin, they're probably going to flag this spending and going to block this going out, right? Like so why it's not nice that they can in general do this. This is a positive aspect of this that they can flag it. And this gives me some calmness because I can say I am to some extent I'm risk free or there's some risk mitigation, right? And something similar would be nice on a module, right? Let's assume we have a registry and the registry says current like when you listed the module it was safe, but then there was a bug bounty attached to it. And actually there was a bug bounty submission going through. There's still a lot of question mark in the details, but let's on a high level, let's keep it as simple. Then it would be nice that then at as soon as this bug bounty is really finalized, latest no interactions can go through the module anymore, right? Like, so any, it's not that every user themselves has to go to their account and say, do I have this module enabled or not? Oh, then I need to deactivate it or migrate away or whatever. No, it's just automatically deactivated and the security assumption is, like the security is guaranteed again. But again, here we see this was an example for the plugin. A plugin should just not be able to execute transaction anymore. But what do we do with a hook? Because if we deactivate just a hook, then your account might become insecure. But if we completely block a hook, then we lock your funds. So again, there you need to potentially 
start with a different security model, like how do you react to a flagging of this module? So in this case, module means a plugin, a hook, or so each or function at last, right? Like each has the different corresponding action when they get flagged. And this is why it's important to separate them a little bit. They can be extended over the future, but uh, since the security assumption for each of them is different, we also need to have different steps to react when something goes wrong there. Yeah, I think some of the interesting aspect of these as we get into like, what does it look like to have automations and, and all of that stuff gets into an open question that you had in the paper, which was this notion of fees and what it looks like to potentially explore fees within different parts of the protocol, including potentially for modules. I would assume that if, if a module is sort of monitoring for you, basically, then you might or even if a I suppose a registry might also be doing it. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the aspect around how you think about incentivizing different players within this ecosystem? Yes. I mean, it's an open question for a reason. So there I probably cannot go too much into details because it's a lot of stuff that we're looking into. But on the high level, right, like what we want to do is it's a value exchange system, right? Like in the sense of different people receive different values. As you mentioned, somebody gets you. You get a automation from a plugin, for example, Prama does DeFi strategies, right? Like the um, the registry is giving you security, so you want to say you have a value exchange where all benefit and that the ecosystem grows together. And this is actually quite hard to do because you kind of need a you need a fee or like a value flow, and then you need to split this value through the corresponding parties. And actually, there is another value flow which potentially is a little bit more obvious, but maybe long term not the the one that will persist is like that you have this discoverability, right? Like a registry, since it's like a central point, it actually provides some discoverability and also they could get paid for this, right? Like as a fee entrance. And I think this is quite common. We know it from the our mobile, from the app store and so on, that you have a listing fee that, for example, as on Apple, as a developer, you have to pay your yearly fee. It's quite low. It's not where Apple makes a big buck, right? Like it's, it's just there, but also there, it is something where you can say that could happen in such a registry case. But more commonly, it's more that the user then pays either for when they activate their plugin or their module. That's similar how you when you pay when you install an app, or when you have some uh, on a transaction base. And on the transaction base, this becomes actually very interesting because there are quite some dynamics to it. First of all, it's not everything happens on chain when it comes to fee payment. Even so, if it would be perfect, but that's it's, it's not always the case. And I'm not even talking about necessarily fiat, but we have state channels. We have other things where money happens in a decentralized way outside of the pure on-chain focus. And on the other hand, we are in a cross-chain world. So I'm actually, there are enough protocols. And one example for this, actually, when you look at from Gelato, they have this one balancing where you have your balance on Polygon, but you can use it everywhere, right? Like that's a very interesting model, which actually might also apply to these module-based things where you want to certain have certain cross-chain interactions. And then certain of these fees also might depend on the value of a transaction or the value that is locked inside a safe, like commonly known as AUM, and like assets under management. This is not the most trivial value to get at because it means you have to kind of understand what tokens are in there, what is the value of the tokens, and verifying all of this also on chain again, it's a non-trivial problem, right? Like, so the big part is here, how do we put all of this into a system that is usable for all of the users and the developers, right? Like in an easy, seamless way. And if you have such a system, then actually, or potentially the more simple part is to split then the fees towards the corresponding ecosystem players. And the, managing all of this with an ecosystem backed by a token potentially right? like so uh, again not nothing of this is really magic describing it the magic will be really figuring out okay how do we make it accessible and how do we make it abstracted away to some extent right like it's another abstraction level and this is which for us is one of the next questions will be really okay how does this work out can we abstract it away is it not possible and yeah it's one of the big topics we're looking into yeah. And so help me understand, you talk about this as kind of an open question and like, obviously we're going to see how this evolves and how people go about building modules, building plugins within the context of like a potential fee mechanism, or even more broadly, like as you're thinking about building the safe core protocol, how much of this logic is something that you need to include in the implementation of it, or in, even in like the standard of it? like supporting fees as one example, and then how much of it can you kind of just like 
abstract allow for a hook if someone wants to add a fee to the hook they can and basically make it something that you don't even have to worry about that's a good question and i'm not sure if there's a right or wrong like i think a couple of things for us that we consider is one point is that if you want to have an ecosystem that thrives and builds you need to also make sure that you can distribute the values in this ecosystem and for this you need to have some form of control over the fees and it's not that it means hey the dao should make the big money here it's really about everybody should get that brings that allows them to further thrive forward and grow because else if everybody just makes sure that most money goes into their own pocket in the ecosystem that doesn't always work the best right like so finding the also the balance because it also should not be that suddenly the people that do all the transaction and should earn the most money then doesn't get anything anymore right like this this will be a big part of this so for us really creating a system where there's a fair value distribution towards the whole ecosystem and all the players will also generate a, in our opinion an attractive ecosystem right like where people want to join and want to thrive but that needs to be proven. I would not put my hand into the fire and say, this is definitely true. We have to see. I think capitalism proved me wrong, but we don't want to be capitalism in the blockchain world necessarily. So that's fair. And the other part is, if everybody does their own solution, we are back at the fragmentation level. And also with the fees, it's the same. Uh, fragmentation makes it harder for the user to understand what is happening with the fee here. Like, is this now a little bit different fee mechanisms than this one? Even so, they both say subscription or something. I have no idea. Maybe one is good, one is bad. And on the other side, also for the developer, if there is no coherent abstraction that is somehow managed by a centralized system. It means every developer thinks about their solution potentially and makes small adjustments, right? Like, and you can draw a lot of parallels that we have with 4337, where of the motivations with 4337 abstracting a concept where you can translate towards an abstraction of fees. Yeah, the, the other sort of element of abstraction here that I think is important to call out that you mentioned as an open question is this question of like chain abstraction is what you call it, but basically like, how do these things work cross chain? Do we need new instances or, or individual instances of these things on every chain? And so, of course, again, an open question. So maybe you don't have all the answers, but I'm curious where your research has gotten you up to now and how you're thinking about this stuff moving forward as far as cross chain aspects of account abstraction. Yes. So actually, I have to be very honest here. When it comes to the protocol, we actually start thinking it first in one chain before we cross, think cross chain. But we do think about cross chain, but there we focus primarily on the account, actually, right? Like in the sense of if we say when it comes to the protocol, potentially in an initial version, it will need to be replicated across multiple chains. But we do believe that this needs to be better solved in the future. And on accounts, there are some very interesting approaches. And one of them was actually outlined by Vitalik in one of his blog posts, right, where it's really about this. Actually, the user should just have it on one chain, right? Like they have their home chain, um, which is their key holder contract. I think he said it. You could see it. That, that's your main safe. And then on the other chains, you actually don't have a full-fledged safe. It's potentially just a small holder that can potentially use modules. And if you want to interact with that safe in the normal logic, you would just generate a storage proof potentially based on zero knowledge proofs and um, proof that on your home chain, you have access to the safe. And therefore you only always need to worry about your home chain and then you can prove it. This sounds very simple. It's not that simple. First of all, zero knowledge proofs are not simple. And second of all, you also zero knowledge proofs require some data like the block header on the chain where you want to prove it. So you would have to distribute. And actually Gnosis is doing quite some research into this. And it's we are working together on prototypes with them. We are exchanging knowledge with them. They have the Hashi project, how they call it, which goes into this direction. Uh, it's very interesting to look into. And there we also working together with partners to create more prototypes and look into this. Ultimately, right, like we need to get to a point, I think, where users do not think about chains. I am not sure how to best do this, but it doesn't matter if you have a home chain and certain chains where you don't, they are not your home chain. But as a user, it's still confusing. How would I know if I should use Polygon ZK EVM layer three or layer two or Arbitrum or Optimism sidechain X? I mean, I already get confused that I think avalanche has multiple contracts chains right like so it's getting so much that uh, even as a user that is in the space for a long time you get confused what do we expect of the users who are not used to it that do not 
grew up in the system basically to to understand what are these chains so yeah so this is the final like the next step would be okay how can we handle this uh, is it required to have something like a meta chain um, lucas internally loved to drop the word safe chain i was never i'm not the biggest fan because i don't think another chain might solve this stuff but i mean also it was just a analogy for having a home chain which is like your home where your safe lives that's why lucas labeled it safe chain and then this from the safe chain you can use also technology similar to ens or ens itself to represent saves on other chains and then the users don't think about chains anymore they think about their like ens name can be discussed is ens the right solution or not different discussion but yeah this i think requires this some work and it's actually another wicked problem <laughs> that we need to tackle and need to look into and it will not be easy it's also a problem that's also independent of account abstraction with a lot of contract cross chain interaction so i think in this conversation alone i hope we've highlighted just like the the massive complexity of the account abstraction problem or at least like began to touch on it obviously a lot of this is still open-ended a lot of this is still fuzzy still stuff that you're working on but you do have some contracts that are already implemented i was looking through the safe protocol manager contract before this i, I appreciate that one you're building in public and you're and you're making the small incremental steps toward that let's fast forward until you get to a place where this is like a production ready or close to production ready protocol what would the upgrade path look like for someone who has their funds in an existing safe and then like i'm sure you're not gonna give us any sort of like estimation on how far we are but in, even in terms of like a percentage like are we two percent of the way to solving this larger problem are we like five percent like what's your take uh, second one is hard so the first one is actually a little bit easier so when we design the protocol, since the existing safe contracts are very flexible, <clears throat> with some overhead, you can activate the protocol on top of it in the sense of that this manager actually acts as like an adapter to translate all these interactions. And this is probably also the first version how we're going to enable it because it allows us to tap into the existing pool of safes and also the existing security of the safes to scale on, uh, based on this. But on our forum, for example, we already mentioned that we're going to look into V2 of the safes and the V2 will be something that is more optimized towards the 4337 or native next steps of account abstraction, right? Like um, we have to see how this evolves, what's going on. I know there's new versions of the entry point coming. How How is this working? So this will be definitely considered for V2 of the safe. And also this whole plug-in protocol approach, this will also be considered there, right? Like it might look very, very different to the existing safes, except that you might have multiple owners. And even also topics like cross-chain proofs might be very relevant. Potentially, it would be awesome if the ecosystem could align, okay, how do we actually store owners, one or multiple, and maybe a threshold? Because if you align on how to store this or where to store it, then it would be way easier to build tooling for cross-chain proofs based on this because information would be a lot more deterministic. But this is really more like safety 2 is for us for next year, actually. So it's not in the distant future, but it's a little bit further away still. Um, for the protocol, at least for first version that we can push also to production networks, it is something that we would love to see this year um, so that you can that we can start gathering input. Because as said, there is just a lot of movement in the space. And even if we have a solution right now, like 437, we have no idea is this a good solution is how close is this to final or not and i mean we can see it in the Ethereum EQ, ecosystem space but right? like stuff changes fast stuff takes longer and some stuff like gets skipped and then <laughs> suddenly we are like uh, one step further and like i mean at some point we wanted to do sharding then we said there is no sharding and now we have an l2 ecosystem where basically we have sharding again right like so it's just very interesting and dynamic so how far are we along with the percentage <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's a mean question. I'm not sure. <laughs> For one milestone, I think we getting to a milestone where you can say, hey, we are at a point we can play it around. We actually decent ways that we get a first version that we can let loose on the crypto native users. Going to a way where we say it's ready to that I can give it to my parents and non-crypto 
folks. I think there we are still in the single digits, I would say. But yeah, before I was in crypto, we were always talking about progress bars. And a friend of mine always said, there's this need for speed progress bar. And a need for speed, how the progress bar worked, it was just filling up in a while and it was like going faster and faster. But at some point, it just stopped at the very end. And it's a little bit like this. I feel like maybe we are very close to it, but we actually don't know what the real progress is. It's just a progress bar moving. And as long as we move, everybody is happy. As long as it's not like the old Windows progress bars, which went backwards, right? Like these are the worst. <laughs> no, I like that philosophy. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. We've only got a couple more minutes here. Chase, did you want to ask anything else before we close out? Yeah, I think two questions for you. So I guess the first is for developers who are listening and are like, ooh, I think starting to build modules or I'm starting to ideate on modules here. You, you mentioned like not quite knowing when this is going to be able to be used, but maybe this year. The way that you're thinking about this protocol in, in the safe ecosystem today, you can just kind of plug in and begin building. Are you thinking you'll be approaching it in a similar way where developers can basically just start building modules and exploring and building on top of this ecosystem? So we are big fans of early feedback. So actually starting from East. No, ECC, so the East Global Hackers on Paris, we actually had bounties related to the protocol and said, please look into it, please play around with it, give us feedback, look at our GitHub, we try to utilize a little bit more the discussions there. And so even on our protocol, we want people to engage early and give us feedback and we, we're going to reward this, especially at hackathons also to have this feedback. And even beyond this, right, like, I encourage everyone to tap into a serial magician's thread. Most of them has also have Telegram groups. Most of the topics um, go for them. Or everybody loves to discuss there. There are some spicy discussions and they are fun to follow. So, yeah, I would recommend everybody to join some of these groups. We love a spicy discussion. Cool. And then one last question for you before we close out that we've been asking all of our guests, which is kind of unrelated to this, though I'm sure you could find a way to tie it back, which is what is one tool or pattern or library that you think developers should check out in the Web3 ecosystem? Maybe it's underrated. Maybe it's totally overrated, but in a valid way, what's one tool pattern library that comes to mind? I don't want to use one of the default contract development tools. That's, that's boring. I think for me, one of the tools that helped me a long way and it's still very fun to use and it's more library. It's, um, the Ethereum JS VM. Uh, it was one of the projects that very, very early let me play around with the VM locally. It, I mean, it's power, it's powering Ganache. It's boring part of hardhead, right? Like, so it's a, like a lot of users are using it without knowing it, but it allows you to dive into it, allows you to actually play around with local simulations, it allows you forking, and it's uh, written in a very nice way that you can actually understand and follow up a lot of these things. And uh, for and since most of developers are TypeScript and JavaScript natives, this is a very nice entry point where you can understand what is actually happening in a Serum VM and how does it work under the hood. And for me, it was a project where uh, I was lucky enough that I was allowed to contribute one time or two times and love seeing this. I would l recommend everybody to check it out and play around with it. Beautiful. It's a cool answer. Yeah, yeah. It's also fun that you've contributed to it. So there's a piece of you in it as well. But it was so fun to, to jam with you and have you on the pod. Where can people learn more about you and what you're doing with Safe Protocol? So you can follow me on Twitter. That's uh R.I. Meissner, so the first two letters of my first name and then my last name. In general, I am probably most active um, nowadays also on GitHub, and we also push more on GitHub related to the protocol. We try to have everything out in the open and push it more on GitHub, right? So that's definitely a good way to follow. If you want to have more direct interactions, there are quite some groups and uh, forum posts where you can reach out, and I'm happy to discuss. So also there. Just reach out to one of, in one of these groups to me or on our forum. I'm always happy to discuss stuff. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on here and talking about all this stuff. I've learned a lot, and I, uh, I'm probably going to go back through and read each of the EIPs now. And your protocol white paper does a really good job. You you talked a lot about the three major EIPs, but you even listed a few more that are pretty relevant to account abstraction. So I highly recommend people go through and read the safe core protocol white paper after this episode yeah. thanks for having me it was also a lot of fun for me I always enjoy this a little bit more getting questions because it gives me a little bit different input how to what is actually open what is what do people want to know 